All right, so um, I'm going to get started. If people come in, the first part of this is like intro anyway. So um, my name is Greg Needell. Um, I've been in FIRST for a long time. This is my presentation called Ro Where Do Robot Parts Come From? Um, a little bit about me, but you didn't come here to hear about me. Uh, you came to hear about robot parts. Um, I founded Rev Robotics a few years ago. I'm sure you guys, some of you guys have heard of that company. Um, I've been involved in FIRST for 17 years, been on a bunch of teams, mentored, pretty much seen FIRST from about every different avenue that you can. Uh, professionally, um, my background's product development and design. I've done all sorts of things all around the world, sold products into pretty much every country that sells products, a um, bunch of patents, a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but so this presentation is a little different than maybe uh, every other presentation that's on, that's going on here. Um, it's first centric in the sense that I'm using a first related item to talk about where stuff comes from, but it's not really a first centric presentation. This is a technology and manufacturing uh, related thing. So it's, I get asked a lot over the years about products that we come out with or even just general stuff like kind of where do they come from, how do they come to be? And I thought it would be really interesting to take a product that most people here know and kind of deconstruct it. Now that's really difficult to do in an hour, uh, but so you're gonna get the like 10,000 foot level of a number of different topics and I'm gonna talk in a lot of generalization. So that's where the fun interactive piece of this goes. I'm happy to go in depth on almost anything here. So if you've got a question, you can raise your hand, especially if it's related. I prefer kind of that style than like hold it to the end or whatever. Let's make this casual. So if you've got questions, let's just kind of have fun with this, okay? Because like I said, I am only gonna be able to gloss over the little tiny bit of this. Um, so just to get a raise of hands, because I know we've got a lot of people here. Um, how many people here are FRC? Most, okay. How many people are FTC? A couple, yeah, holding it down, all right. That's fine. So Rev Robotics makes parts for both. Um, oh, FLL, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. FLL, that's awesome. Um, so, but the good news is that the stuff I'm gonna talk about kind of encompasses a little bit of everything. Um, the product I chose for this is a Spark motor controller. Um, this is not a sales pitch for the Spark motor controller. It's just there's one of them that was in every single FRC kit of parts for the last two years. So odds are whether you use it on your robot or not, uh, you have had one and you've probably held one in your hand or at least you've seen one on the table over there or in the bin that's underneath the table over there. That's fine. It was more of a familiarity thing more than a what the specific product is. So um, what we're going to talk about is a few common manufacturing methods of math produ mass production, why we use them, um, some trade-offs associated with design, and then just some general insights in hardware development, um, which should be interesting. So jumping right in, um, over the past, um, I'm gonna say the last decade, um, off-the-shelf parts and components for robots have become a lot more common, right? I mean, when I started, there was no Andy Mark, there was no Vex Pro, there was no Rev, there was no anything. We had a box of parts and most of it was junk, and uh, we had to make that junk work. Um, there were suppliers that we use that literally no longer exist anymore, and it was a lot more restricted. But what's great is that as the rules change, you can buy a lot of things, which both helps enable teams to not have to design everything from scratch, but also the teams that could design everything from scratch, also saving time, right? So if you had to design that gearbox every single time you had to make it, it would take a lot of time out of your season, and instead of having crazy four cube scoring, scale scoring robots or um, full uh, crypto box fillers, or I wish I had an FLL reference. Um, I don't, I'm sorry. Um, there's just a lot more to it. So off the shelf parts. I'm gonna address this one um, really off the front. This is not a political debate about made in China versus made in the USA. Um, I'm especially sensitive to the fact that we are in one of the manufacturing hearts of the United States right here in Michigan. Um, but I'm gonna kind of tell you how we do it. So most of the stuff that Rev makes um, and a lot of other um, FRC, FTC parts are made in Asia. Um, the, the traditional thing, if you Google or wanna get into this depth, you see a Venn diagram kind of like what you see there, good, fast, cheap. 
right, where you can pick two but not have all of them. Um, there's a lot to this. You can make really awesome parts in Asia. You can make really parts, awesome parts in the United States. Uh, you can make cheap parts in the United States. You can make expensive parts in the United States and say you kind of go all over the board. Um, what I do believe in is manufacturing to the skill of the manufacturers. There's different skills in different regions of the world. And depending on what you're trying to do, that helps. The other one that I really um, am sensitive to is supply chain. And you know, any, a lot of, nothing is a single country anymore. Um, whether it says made in the USA or made in China or made in Taiwan or anywhere, it's of the, con of the parts, right? So you take a electric motor that was made in the USA, well, where does the copper from come from? Where does the plastic come from? Where does, you know, these are supply chain things. We can get into that debate a lot, but at the end of the day, Rev makes things in Asia mainly for um, consideration um, of supply chain and getting everything in one place. Um, Asia, in our experience, is one of the only places in the world where we can get everything we need for all the parts without having to ship things around the world 10 times. Um, when it comes to FTC, and some of you might know the program First Global that we're involved in, we ship products to 160 countries. And so by shipping products to 160 countries, every single time something travels across an ocean, it adds a little bit of money that is literally just adding money to the bottom line of shipping companies. It's not adding value to a product. And so that's where we fall on that debate. But um, if you want to have another conversation about this one, I'm happy to do so. It's just this would eat like all of championship. We could be in a room talking about this. So we're not going to talk about this. Um, product design. Uh, this is another really big topic that we could, people study this. There's courses in it. Um, I can't consolidate this down to an hour, but I can talk about some of the high points. So on um, the beginning of January, uh, how many of you guys get a challenge, right? Everybody gets a challenge, right? And then you sit there and you say, oh, well, how do we solve this thing? Or what, what's some ideas? And you take those ideas and then you, you brainstorm those ideas. Maybe you build some prototypes. Those prototypes suck. And then you have to go back in time and, and make some more um, prototypes. And then you finally get to a solution and then you go and do finalized design on that solution, and then you go manufacture that solution, and you kind of maybe go back one more time. Okay, that is literally the exact same thing that product design does, um, specifically for tangible physical things. We set a scope of what we're trying to design. In this case, we're trying to design a low-cost motor controller, right? And we start with simple tests, components, things. How are we going to make this? How do we get the price down? Um, we have to understand who our market and customers are. What do our customers need in a product? And then we move to prototypes fast. We build boards. We blow up PCBs. We, we light motor controllers on fire, not intentionally most of the time. And um, we just we continue to fail fast. The faster we fail, the faster we get to that next hurdle. And then finally, when you get to something good, you kind of go to production. But that same, like that really fun, like, thing that you get during build season, that's why I love product development. So every product that we have ever come out with or have ever worked on goes through that, a very similar cycle. So it's like build season, but like every single day, which is awesome and terrifying at the same time. So um, let's talk about the Spark motor controller for some context. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen this, but uh, we launched it in 2016. Um, it's been every, in every single FRC kit of parts in 2017 and 18. Um, and we purpose built it. So the, the purpose of this motor controller was to be low cost, robust, and simple, right? Um, addressing some elephants in the room, we actually have nothing against any of the other motor controllers that are legal for FRC. They all just have their different purposes. Um, I believe in, you know, every FRC team has different levels. And like, you know, I think the, the Talon is the most popular motor controller. And if you need advanced controls and you need all the feature sets, that's awesome, it's great. Um, strong endorsement if you need those feature sets. But they're $90 a piece, right? Sparks are $40. So for half the price, you can still spin a motor, you can still do controls, you just don't get all of the fancy features. But if your job is to just spin a motor, that's what it was. So we didn't design the Spark to be everything to everyone, we designed it for this very specific feature set. So that's uh, that. And also, I said this before, why the Spark? So familiarity, everyone gets it. Um, it's got a bunch of different manufacturing processes. And then the other one is that I have good photos of the Spark. There's a lot of times when I'm like, 
we're, we're, we're making something that I'm just like totally forget about taking photos. I'm sure some of you are familiar, specifically my FTC folks, when they try to make their engineering notebooks, they're like, oh man, I gotta make something up. What, what did that drawing on the whiteboard look like during week two? I don't know. Um, okay, so um, it's, it's all about continuous improvement. So this is the design cycle. Um, what you see on the top is as many screenshots as I could grab from, from changes. And as you can see, where you start and where you end are actually two different things. But the main thing is understanding your customer, understanding what you're trying to develop to, and then once you get, in, get to that point, identify that you've reached that point and stop. Um, if you just continue down that process forever, you would, be, you would never launch a product, right? I'm not saying that this product is perfect or any one that I've ever made is perfect because what is perfect but just hitting a spec anyway, but one more feature means one more week, one more month, or one more year, and so you have to draw the line somewhere. Um, on the bottom, you can see how the, uh, the actual circuit board itself even evolved. Um, we learned a lot of things when we do this. So I believe in a fail faster method, which is literally, I want to build as many boards as I possibly can. I want to test them because while CAD and electrical design and everything in simulation on the computer is great, you learn about 100 times more when you hold something in your hand than just looking at a computer. You know, the number of times I've gotten lost in scale where I'm designing something that's like this big on a computer and it looks this big and then it's like you 3D print it or you build it and you're like, oh, that little feature that I struggled with literally just disappears into the scale of what I'm working on. So holding something and testing something is always good. All right, so that's kind of my overall about product development design. Like I said, this is like the, the high level. So here's the breakdown and I have, I have a deconstructed one over here. Maybe, it was in my backpack, so. Deconstructed Spark. Okay, so three main parts of the Spark that we're gonna talk about today. Um, the heat sink of the Spark, this guy, is an aluminum extrusion. Um, the uh, center part, obviously the circuit board, um, and then the outer part, the plastic case. So we're gonna talk about the manufacture of each one of those three methods. Um, I have lots of videos, so this is kind of fun. So uh, aluminum extrusion. Um, Every single robot in all of FIRST, FTC, FRC, sorry guys, not FLL, but every single one of you has an aluminum extrusion of some sort on your robot. Um, whether it's the style up top, like our extrusion linear motion rail, 80-20 T-slot, or uh, even Versa, Versa frame, or some of the, all those other, they're all extruded, right? Um, and then you also have some of the parts like shaft collars and hubs that actually start as an extrusion and then they're machined afterwards. So ultimately, what is aluminum extrusion? Um, aluminum extrusion, how many of you guys have played with Play-Doh when you were little? Everybody raise your hands. If you're not, you're lying. All right. So, um, so when you had Play-Doh, whether you like squeeze it through your hands and it kind of like shoots out your hand or you had the little like funny guy with like made hair or like you pressed out and it was like made pasta, that is extrusion, and basically aluminum extrusion is nothing but doing that, but with molten aluminum, so it's like 10 times cooler at least. Um, maybe not as fun to eat, but you know, it's, it's a thing. Um, so aluminum extrusion, because it is a, a process where you're pushing something um, through a die, over here on the, uh, this guy right here is an aluminum extrusion die. Um, you can do almost anything in a 2D plane with an aluminum extrusion. So if you were to draw a picture in your notebook right now of almost any shape, you could make that out of aluminum. But it's gonna be long and drawn out. So if you think about just from a directionality standpoint, it, things that are good for aluminum extrusion are things that are long and drawn out. So obviously structural members, you know, but if you look at our heat sink from the side, it's just a rectangular shape pressed out that way. Um, we do this because it's really cost effective. So just a couple design restrictions as you're thinking about it, and I'm sure that you know, if you look around this room, I can point out a bunch of aluminum extrusions. But um, uniform wall thickness, um, that's more of a guideline than a rule because I cheat that one all the time. But basically, you, um, you, ha you can't have like a super thick section over on one side and a really thin piece on the other side. If you think about pushing a piece of molten aluminum through a die, it'll curve and you want to keep this stuff straight. Um, singular cross cut sections, which is just what I said, draw it, if you can draw it on a piece of paper, you can extrude it. Um, 
rounded corners. Um, for those of you who have done other things, things like fillets and inside corners, it makes it a lot easier to like push out of the die um, so it doesn't get caught. Um, part symmetry, so things that are symmetrical are easier to extrude. They're, it's not impossible to do things that are not symmetrical, but it's just a symmetry thing. Uh, uniform use of aluminum is really what comes into that. And then um, minimizing internal cavities. So going back one slide, um, some people might have noticed this. So up at the top corner is our version of a structural aluminum. See how this corner is notched out? So there's some fun reasons and some use for that, but one of the reasons to do that is to make manufacturing more effective on the extrusion, not having that full internal profile makes it easier to extrude. So there's a lot of things that, you know, even on the bottom, like this is an Andy Mark hub down here. And you see how the holes that you normally bolt to are open to the outside. By having those open to the outside, it makes it significantly easier to extrude. So going back. All right, so uh, now let's just dig in. This is what an extrusion facility and layout looks like. Uh, it's a big, long, quasi-dirty dirty plant. Um, some of them are cleaner than others. But basically, uh, this whole starts with these, with these logs. Um, and so if you see a type of aluminum, like 6061, 6063, 7075, these, these numbers that you've probably seen that you kind of understand that 7075 is stronger than 6061, um, basically they all start as these logs. And they are cut to the size of the machine, and they are heated, heated up, and they are literally just pushed through with a hydraulic ram. That's about as simple as it is. The rest of this is all post-process, which I'll get to. But um, rather than me talk more, here's our first video of the day. Um, this is a extrusion machine. And I'm going to see if how I can play this video. There you go. Um, so what you can see here is they are actually loading. They're going to load this slug of preheated aluminum into there. Giant hydraulic press comes from this side. And they are literally just pushing this through a die that's sitting kind of in this world over here. And I'm going to swing to the other side here with the camera. This is my graceful video skills. And uh, what you can see, and I'm sorry it's so washed out, but um, there's basically just a long strip of aluminum coming out of there. So you just turned a bar into a very, very long strip of aluminum that quickly. Um, there's a number of things when you build it. They have to do things like straighten it because it wants to bend and curve on you. Um, and then if you've ever seen those, those nomenclature like the T6 or T5 after 6061, um, that is a uh, heat treating process. So T5 is a very quick heat treating process where they basically have to raise and lower the temperature at a rate, and that's to set the aluminum. Um, T6 is typically a little bit harder because it's a much longer time to, uh, to do it. It's kind of the difference between if you heat something up with a blowtorch and just like drop it in a bucket of water and instantly quench it versus letting it cool down over time. Um, like I said, there's a lot of extra technical there that I'm glossing over, but um, those numbers actually mean something. Um, generally in the realm of first, that stuff doesn't matter so much. Um, any one of the pieces of aluminum that you get are currently going to be strong enough. There are differences in how they machine and post-process, but from an overall strength standpoint, they're pretty close. Unless you have to weld it, right? So it, it's all about post-processing, right? So some stuff welds better than others. Some stuff machines better than others. Um, slightly different strengths, whether it's bending or tensile or compression, what you're using on it. But overall, it's, that's the process for this. Any questions so far? No? I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, OK, so what comes next? Um, so then they cut it. Um, so in this case, they literally sliding it up, and this is like an ultra, sorry, OSHA is not really a thing in China. Um, it is, but it isn't. So they basically go up, and there's a saw, and I don't actually know why that didn't feel like that played. Oh, so basically this shield comes down, it cuts all these little pieces into little tiny machinable bites. Um, so in the case of the aluminum extrusion here, this would be where that becomes like this. Um, the next step here is uh, ex machining. We don't actually do any post-machining on the spark uh, extrusion, but 
in many cases, you're going to get parts. They are going to be post-machined. But remember, this is all about manufacturing. And, and one of the keys to manufacturing is the less times that someone has to touch it, the less it costs. Right? So if you can do bolt something up and make one, it's going to be a lot more expensive than if you can put a bunch of these little tiny parts in these fixtures and load these fixtures into CNC machines and like, let it go to town making, uh, making holes. Uh, these are little, um, if you've ever played with 8020 or uh, any of the extrusions, these are nut plates. So like these are the little uh, nut strips that you slide inside. So in this case, they're extruded out of aluminum, cut to length, and then they machine these three little holes in about a gajillion of these every single day. That's not a Rev product. This is just something they were making while I was there. Um, so the next step is uh, anodization, making them look pretty. Um, you've probably seen stuff anodized. The most common two colors are clear. Um, you typically don't get aluminum that's not anodized uh, unless it's raw, raw stock. But finished products typically are anodized either clear or black, by far the most two processes. Um, anodization does have an effect on performance. So um, it prevents the aluminum from oxidizing. It is an oxidization process on its own. Um, it's a chemical process, but a lot of times it is for aesthetics. There are some characteristics that allow it to be like a smoother surface finish, or um, there are some papers and arguments that if you anodize it, they have slightly better air to material heat transfer properties and a few things like that. Uh, we take all that into effect. No, most of ours is just to look pretty. Um, they also make it in all different colors. So if you've ever seen, um, I know Andy Mark does a bunch of like churros in different colors. Uh, all that stuff is anodized. And it's a chemical dip bath where not to, uh, where they essentially put a charge on the parts themselves and they essentially do some chemical magic to make the color bond. And it's really, really thin. It's like measured in like sub-micron thicknesses. Uh, so when you do stuff like anodizing, you don't have to worry so much about the material thickness adding. But if you were to paint it or you were to powder coat it, for example, to change the color, you'll have to worry about the thickness of the part or ceramic coated or things like that. So w that's one of the other really nice things about this is that the dimensions and tolerances when it's actually made are pretty much the same through the whole process. So that's pretty fun. Um, how we do the marking on there is we actually laser etch the anodization off the, uh, the uh, parts. And so you can do a lot of things, like we can print, pad print, and ink on there, but it tends to wear off. So we actually put those in a laser and laser etch off the anodization. Uh, a lot of, you'll see a lot of things marked this way. It's pretty common. Do I have everybody so far? They, they will oxidize. Um, they will, oxidization in aluminum is generally a clear oxidization, so you won't see it. And I know nothing in my brain that tells you it impacts it in any notable way. So it will, but really we're just, it's really for an aesthetic thing. And I know how, uh, you know, labels and stickers fall off. Um, I want to make sure that everything kind of looks good, even though most teams cover them with tape and write like one, two, three, four, five on them, we're still going to brand it just a little bit. Yeah, we could do that. I, I mean, it's one of the things we like them flat um, for that reason, because we knew that people are going to do that. Um, um, all right, so that's all I got on aluminum extrusion. Is there any questions about that metal process? It's still interesting so far, maybe a little bit. Okay. This is where it's going to get interesting, and this is where um, uh, my partner in Rev, David, uh, this is like his whole section and world, but I'm going to present about it just so he can make fun of this, uh, the video of this presentation later. Um, so electronics. So um, the electronic side is obviously the, the most important part in a, in a component like the Spark. It is an electrical device. The extrusion has a heat sinking process. It removes heat from it so that you can drive more power through it. But really, this is where all the magic happens. So we start with a schematic, which is no different than the electrical layout of your robot. The Rio connects to this, connects to your battery. But all we're doing is we're doing that at um, a component scale. So it's just individual. Instead of a 
Robo Rio as a complete device, we're using a single chip processor or a, and instead of you know an entire relay module, we use a MOSFET. You know, these are, these are just different building blocks for building schematic, and so he lays out the, the schematic, and that takes some time, and we blow some stuff up when we make mistakes. That's a very math-driven design. You need this size capacitor or this size resistor to get this effect. Um, but the next part is actually the harder part, and I actually, which is the board layout. Um, obviously, everybody in FRC and FTC and FLL, I didn't forget about you, um, wants things to be as small as they can. Now, some of that you can do, and but the size impacts the performance um, in a lot of different ways. So he does the board layout. So the schematic is like this component connects to this component, connects to this component, and then all of this works. Generally, we build like a big board or a sample that's not size constraint to learn a lot um, in case we need to like jumper stuff around. But then when we get to the board layout, it's like how do you get stuff as tight as you can without impacting performance? There is an art form to board layout. Um, I, we get a really good piece of software, all FRC teams and FCC teams get, get some free software, it's in your, your vouchers, um, you should go try it. There's some really cheap make your own board uh, tutorials on YouTube, you can go spend hours down the YouTube rabbit hole trying to learn how to do that, but it's really fun. And then um, once we have the schematic, we send that off to our manufacturers to get them made. We don't make them in-house. It's a they do a number of different things. It involves layers of copper bonded with layers of essentially fiberglass into multiple thicknesses, and then they're plated and etched and covered. Um, as I said, there's lots of steps there. Um, and then we get boards out the other side. Like I said, there's great YouTube videos on all this. Um, I just accept that as that happens these days. Um, the one thing I will say on the board layout and the printed circuit boards is that um, you have the ability, even though this looks like a single like piece, um, there's multiple layers you can have. So um, this board is actually a reasonably simple, it's a two layer board, which means you have the electrical connections on the top and the bottom, um, but you can go to four layer board or six layer board. And what that allows you to do is, when you have to connect you know, part A to part B over here, and then you have part C and part D, if you just went this way and this way, those two lines now cross and somebody has to jump over something else. And you can't do that on a single layer, otherwise nothing's gonna be able to be hooked up. So you add extra layers, so you say, okay, A to B is on the bottom, and C to D is on the top, and then the smaller you wanna get it, you add more layers, so you have different layers to interconnect things. So um, we actually, our manufacturer is really good. They have prototyping short run. Um, they're obviously more expensive than um, making them in mass production, but you can send board layouts out and for not a lot of money, you can get boards back and build up prototypes. I mean, it used to be a lot harder, but now there's plenty of, uh, plenty of services. I, I fully endorse, there's a, the website that, it's, it's actually a friend of mine's website, but uh, it's Dirty PCBs. If you ever wanna make some cheap printed circuit boards. They're really great, upload them five or six days for about $40, you can get 10 copies back. Um, there's also OSH Park, um, and there's a whole bunch of them, but it's pretty easy to prototype simple boards, two layer boards, four layer boards. When you start getting into like eight and 10 and 12 layer boards, things like, uh, like the motherboard in your computer or the um, circuit board in your phone, they start getting really expensive and getting a lot more specialized. But anything south of about six layers these days is pretty commodity to do. You can even do like flexible circuits and things, prototype pretty easy. All right, so um, producing the boards, um, this is the, the overall steps from top to bottom. And I have videos of most of these steps. So this gets more fun than me just talking about each one of these steps. So. Um, Adding solder paste. How many people have soldered a wire before, right? So you're like, okay, perfect, everyone soldered a wire. So you've got these wires, you're going together, you heat them up, you, you put solder to them. If you think about doing that at this scale, you're gonna go crazy, right? So we use, um, 
things like pick and place machines, which are robot machines that place components. But we also use solder paste, which is a flux that's got little tiny bits of solder in it. And so you can put it on, apply it like a liquid or more of a gel. And when you heat it up, it congeals into a solid piece of solder, right? The, the, the material that's holding the little tiny bits of solder in it kind of melt away or smoke away, and then all that's left is the metal and it's molten. So applying solder paste. Um, um, SMT is a surface mount, which means it's a component that is just adhered to one layer. So like the top or the bottom, it doesn't go through the board. Um, in this case, we have surface mount components on the top, surface mount components on the bottom, and then also um, uh, we have larger ones, and then we also have uh, through hole components, which are like things that are really need to be mechanically bonded as well as electrically bonded. They actually go all the way through the board. Um, those are replaced um, either machine or by hand, and then soldered, and then you test and program. So let's watch some videos, because videos are fun. Um, so this is the solder paste process. It looks a lot like t-shirt making, if you've ever done any of that. Um, so every single one of those holes on the top, they use the board layout of the spark boards to basically push that solder paste into very, very specific locations. So only paste goes where things need to be soldered. So he checks it. It goes through. It's an automated process. Then he visually checks the boards. And then just to the right, it's actually an automated uh, line where he can put a good one down and move to the next step. This is the really fun video that everybody likes. Um, this is a pick and place machine. So every single time that that thing touches the board, it's laying down a component. And those components can come, they come on reels. And every single time it picks one up, it could be in a different orientation. So part of this machine, which is crazy to think about, is it picks up a component, it holds it over a camera, the camera identifies the component, what orientation that component is actually in. It rotates that component to the right orientation and puts it in the right physical location on the board and then gets out of the way for the next one. So that process is happening. Now, now that I've given that, I'm going to say that, show that again. So every single time that is an individual component that's being individually set. So that's pretty quick. The, the sound on this video sounds exactly like you would think it would be, where it would be like um, no sound. So. So that, this is like would be the top part of pick and place. These are small parts, little tiny baby parts that if you drop into the carpet, they're gone forever. Um, and so you can go really, really fast because the mass of the component is basically irrelevant. Um, this is the, the next pick and place. So this is bigger parts. Um, so same process. It's grabbing an individual part each time it puts it down, but it's a little bit slower because the mass matters and a lot of times, you want to make sure that these are in the exact right spot. Um, the parts that they're doing big parts on, these typically cost dollars. The ones that they do really fast typically cost cents. So there's a loss piece. You can lose a lot of the little tiny ones, um, and then they'll catch it during the thing. But when you've got a, a main controller that's, you know, on some of the stuff that we do, could be $15 for every single time it puts one down. Um, you want to make sure that it's oriented in the right orientation and everything's good. So that's that. Um, so the next step is reflow. So I talked about uh, it's like you melt this paste and magically everything is soldered. Well, essentially, they put them on trays. You see we build these four at a time. And once these, these are all, they're not finished yet. They're just in place. The solder paste is kind of holding it. It's like not cured, but not moving, and then we send this through an oven. And this oven is like a giant pizza oven. No joke, that's kind of what it is. I, I, I've never cooked pizza on one of these ovens, but I'm sure that it would turn out awesome if I wasn't afraid of all the stuff that's in there from all the boards. But, um, it, it's, but anyway, so as this thing cooks, um, there's different zones. Um, it's highly controlled what the temperatures are. Uh, different components have different temperature rises. They have to live in those ranges, and then the solder uh, flux kind of burns away, and then the components are, are all good. So that's a pretty easy process. Um, finished boards and test fixtures. So one of the things that we do to every single motor controller that comes off 
is we do functional testing on 100% of them, which means we spin motors at 60 amps in forwards and reverse on every single motor controller we do. And the reason we do that is we don't want to ship you a bad one, right? Look, every manufacturing process is statistical in nature, right? No matter how good the process is, you will get bad parts. The difference between a good quality product and a bad quality product is how good you are at catching your mistakes where they can be fixed before they reach a customer, right? So by doing this testing on every single one of them, we know that it is very unlikely that you get one that's bad. Now, they may still slip through, but um, we would rather fail one here where we can send it back through the process and they've got an entire group that does nothing but like takes boards that have failed these tests, they, they evaluate them, figure out why, and then they repair what it is and then they retest them, right? So it's not complete scrap, it's just, you know, it takes a little bit longer to pass. Um, like me and some of my math courses in college, it just takes a little bit longer. Um, so um, those little pins you see on the bottom, those are called pogo pins. And so rather than like screwing a wire to every single one of these things or plugging in a PWM cable, which is not efficient, these are spring-loaded pins that are wired to the board and everything that we use to actually test. So you clamp it down, it makes all the electrical connections almost instantly, you turn it on, they do a test procedure, each one takes about a minute to a minute and a half, and if they pass, they move on, and if they fail, they get rejected and then they eventually end up back on the tester. This is also where we program them to. So we program the boards, we do a test, and then we program the boards again. Um, so we have a test program to test all the things. So, yeah. Um, that's a great question. Um, I don't have an exact number for you. Um, it generally, if you have a good manufacturing line, you're gonna see somewhere between one and 3% failure. Um, that's just industry standard for different industries. That's kind of what you see. I would say our numbers are kind of like that. So on, you know, 10,000 motor controllers, you can do the math on the number of hundreds that would probably get sent back through the system. But up to this point, there is nothing unique about this motor controller. It is just a series of parts that has been programmed. And so most of the time, a part has fallen off during the pick and place process or something has been mislodged it's generally something that's like, oh, hey, let's, that's the thing right there, fix it, and then it's a good board again. Um, the failures of just circuit boards is actually a pretty easy process. Um, but it is all about quality control, how clean the facility is, um, how up-to-date their equipment is, did the person who programmed the machine do a good job, um, are the components legitimate? You know, that's a whole nother hours of conversation about supply chain of like, is this part that it says it is what it is actually what it is, um, and where do they come from? That's a whole other thing. But generally, it's you know just in the hundreds of the year each year. But you know of ones that cannot be recovered, you're talking about like ten or something, and that's mostly due to the actual circuit board itself being damaged before it went sent through. All right. Um, any other questions about electronics? Like I said, this is like the super high level. All right, so uh, the last one we're gonna talk about is the case, um, and this case on this one is injection molded, um, along with about every, most other things that are plastic that you interact with on a regular basis. Injection molding is by far the most popular way of making plastic, um, making plastic parts. So here goes. Um, Injection molding, um, basically, how many of you guys have a 3D printer or have seen a 3D printer or know what a 3D printer does? Awesome. See, six years ago, this would have been a totally different landscape here. Um, so uh, 3D printers, the most common ones are, they have a spool of plastic, the FDM, and it extrudes and it melts the plastic and lays it down, right? So an injection molder is basically the first part of that scaled up. Instead of it on a spool, you start with pellets, and then you go directly from pellet through an extruder with pressure and heat, and then you push it into a mold. And so it is another process where you're taking a material that you typically think about as a solid, and you work with it in the construct of a liquid. Um, there's a lot of these changing states that happen in a lot of efficient manufacturing processes. So 
some considerations of when to injection mold and when not to injection mold. Um, it's great for fast production, right? Boom, 20 seconds, boom, 20 seconds, boom, 20 seconds. I can get a part every 20 seconds for forever. Um, it's super accurate, right? Especially when you start dealing with one cavity or multi -ca single cavity things, like every spark might as well be a clone of the, of the previous one. There's very little that's gonna change from this one to that one to the, to the next one. And also, this is really, really affordable. Because it's a very automated thing, the cost of labor doesn't really matter, the, the material is really cheap, they're really high quality if you do a good job on the mold, and it, it's, they're very low cost, right? Plastic is very inexpensive, that's why we use so much of it. Um, as a, you know. Um, but the, the, the negatives to injection molding, and these are the big ones, um, large investment on cost, right? Making a mold is an expensive thing. Um, generally speaking, um, and now this, this is one of those things that varies region to region. Um, it's much more expensive in the United States to make a mold than it is in, in Asia. Um, but typically an injection mold, low end, you're gonna pay four to $5,000 for a mold, maybe for something like this, right? And then if you start talking about like big automotive parts, like dashboards and things like that, you can spend a million dollars on a single mold. Um, and part of that comes down to the materials that are being used because you're talking about high temperature, high precision, the steel that makes up the mold is a high end steel. So it's very hard, it takes a long time to machine and make, the material's expensive, everything kind of rolls together. Um, long lead times. Um, in China, where everything reasonably happens at fast speed, it takes me between four and six weeks to make a new injection molded part. In the United States, I've seen quotes as long as 16 to 20 weeks. And that's from the moment that you have released your design to when you're holding the first shot. That has nothing to do with design, that's just literally the machine time. And, it, and it's based on how long it takes to cut the steel, but also what is the capacity of who's making this mold. There's Molding is one of those things where there's only so many people that have the expertise to do it that they, you have to wait for the one before you to be done and then somebody's waiting for yours to be done. So it's a kind of a stacked up process. Um, lastly, because we're cutting steel, guess what? Changing stuff is not easy, right? If you have a part that you're gonna wanna uh, change, you know, you wanna make 100 this way and then 100 that way and 100 that way, do not do injection molding. Stay away from it. Um, um, so that's a thing. Also, with the with the investment cost, um, just a little bit of financial economics here for you. Um, if a part costs, you know, if a mold costs five thousand dollars, and you're only going to make a thousand of something, that means that basically five dollars in cost of your mold gets put on every part, right? So that you have to hit a minimum volume before injection molding makes any sense at all. If you're gonna make a mold, if a mold costs five, you know, said 5,000, you only make 1,000. Now, if your product is 200 bucks, maybe that's fine. But if your product's 40 bucks, that's really unacceptable. If you're gonna make 100,000 of something and it's 5,000, then it, well, it doesn't really matter, right? So there's a scale that you have to understand with every one of these manufacturing processes. Because if this cost me 10 cents out of an injection mold, um, but I had to invest $5,000 to get 10 cents, and I'm gonna have $5 on every part. That makes no sense, but if I'm gonna make 100,000, or if I only wanna make 1,000 of them, and I could choose another process, casting or roto molding or, a lot, or even machining is things, maybe each one cost me, instead of 10 cents, it cost me three or $4 a piece. Well, three or $4 is still cheaper than $5 a piece when you talk about the cost of the mold. So there's some economics there. None of them are that hard, but that's how decisions are made on manufacturing quite a lot of the time is how it's made versus how much the piece price costs versus the investment, and there's a volume piece of that. Um, um, with changing, you don't want to change, right? So like injection molding too early, if you go too early, a small touch-up you can absolutely do, but if you mold something wrong, most of the time you're just throwing money away. And I am happy, not happy, but I will admit that over my career so far, I have made some mistakes. Some of them were very large, um, and I've paid for them. 
literally and figuratively. But um, you try to avoid that. The more iterations on the design, the more 3D printing, the more prototyping, the better off you are. Um, so make sure you, you're good there. Um, so DFM, um, DFM stands for Design for Manufacturing. Ultimately, that's what I've been talking about this whole time, whether you know it or not. DFM is a thing you can study, um, whether it's electrical or mechanical engineering. It's just a piece of it. How do you make the things that you design? Um, I like to put DFM early in the design process because it's much more efficient to say, here's the thing I'm building, how are we going to make it, versus I've designed this whole giant thing, now how am I going to make it, which is just going to cause you to go back in time and redesign. So um, if you work with really good uh, vendors, uh, a lot of times you'll give them the design and they'll be like, yeah, you're stupid, here's a couple things we need to change. Um, if you work with vendors that don't care, they'll just make your stuff wrong and then you're going to be crying later. So um, picking vendors is important. So uh, everything, with injection molding, there's a number of considerations. I can't go into all of them. Um, a couple of the big ones, though, are everything has to have an angle to it. And that might frustrate robot teams. I know I've heard it. Trust me, I know these walls are not straight, guys. When you stack these up, there's a gap. Um, it's for moldability. So when you release from the mold, you need to have an angle. It's called a draft angle. Otherwise, you can't pull this out of the mold. Um, so there's things like that. Um, there's also minimum feature sizes. If you make little tiny small spots, it's very difficult to mold. And a lot of times that tool will end up breaking in those spots, which will cut your tool goes down, you have to repair it, you have to pay to repair it. So, you know, there is something to the chunkiness of this design, right? It may not be the sleekest, most elegant thing, but man, it's really easy to manufacture. And that's, there's something to that as well. Um, uh, the mold design. Mold design, in my opinion, is as much an art as a science. Um, I have never designed my own mold. I've designed hundreds of items that have been injection molded. I've never designed my own mold. Um, this is a basic layout. Um, you know, we talked about kind of the, the 3D printing piece of it. So through this top nozzle is where they squirt molten aluminum, or sorry, molten plastic. Um, it kind of goes down there, and then in this block of steel is the negative to this piece of plastic, right? So it squirts it in, it fills the void, and then out comes a part. I'm going to show you a video in a second. Um, all these other lines, um, basically these ones that look like pneumatic fittings, uh, they're actually for water lines. It's because you're dealing with high temperature. The, the molds themselves actually have to be cooled. Otherwise, to get the parts to the right size, plastic warps and moves and so does metal so you have to cool control the temperature of the whole process very very closely um, uh, these are um, guides this thing opens and closes that's how it ejects it um, and that's kind of what a mold looks like sorry I'm running a little short on time so I'm gonna keep going um, you do get uh, the ability to review the design of the uh, molds so even though I don't make them I get to say hey I don't like that here and there uh, there's really only two things that I give feedback on on molds, and that's where is the gate, which is where the plastic is actually injected into the part. Um, you have probably picked up a piece of plastic and seen like if it's a black part, like a little white spot, or like maybe there's like one part that's like a little bit sharper than everyone else. That's where the plastic was shot into the plastic, in, into the mold. Um, I always try to hide that stuff on the underside so that you don't see it. Um, some people do a better job at hiding it than others. The other thing that you have, I guarantee you've seen is the ejector pin locations. So to get the mold, the plastic out of the mold, you have to actually use metal pins to push it out when it's still hot and it leaves little circles or rectangles on your part. So if you ever go look at like a, anything plastic and you see these like, what are these weird like circles on it? It means it was injection molded and that's just metal touching it when it's still warm. Again, I try to hide all that stuff. So on the spark, you won't see any of those on the, on the outside. But if you look on the inside, you'll see plenty of them. Um, parts that you see the inside and the outside, one side typically always looks better than the other. It's just a part of the manufacturing. Um, all right, let's look at videos. We like videos. Um, oops. No, play the video. It's not good. That's a fun video, too. Um, this is sad. 
Maybe, oh, you know what? It's not a video. Sorry, the video is forward. Sorry. Um, this is a picture. This is a picture of a mold. Um, for those in FTC, this is a picture of our um, inside corner bracket mold. Um, it's just a flat bracket. Like a lot of FRC teams use metal versions of this. This is a plastic version. You can see for every single one of these, we get four plastic parts. Um, that's another piece of the economics of molds. Um, because, like I said, every single time someone touches it, it adds price or adds cost to it. So if you can make four of something every time you make one, that's better than making one every time you make one. Um, and if you can make 16 of them every time you make one, you can do better. Like Lego bricks, oh, this is fun. Lego bricks, guys, right? Injection molded, all right? Um, Lego bricks, typically, they make four of them at a time. Um, they could make a lot more of them, but to control the tolerance, because every Lego brick for the last, like, 20 years can still snap into each other, um, in order to control the tolerance, they have to control the heat, and that means they can only do four at a time. There's some amazing... Lego making videos of injection molding online. Um, this is mold making. Um, this process is called RAM EDM. I told you it's really hard to make a mold. Um, this guy is basically an electrode, and every single time it touches it, it's essentially zapping the steel beneath it. And that removes these like microns of steel. And so to drill a hole that's this deep, that might take five hours. Right? So this is a very, very slow process to make a mold. Um, the reason they use uh, EDM is because typically the hardness of the material doesn't come into play when they, make, when they machine it. So like if you're CNCing something, um, the hardness of the material impacts how fast you can do it. With uh, an EDM process, generally the hardness doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, this is what a mold shop looks like, um, a mold shop in China. I'm, I'm not shy about where our stuff comes from. Um, this is what it looks like. And so what you can see here is, like, this is a small mold, like maybe about the size of the one that made the spark. This is a big mold <laughs> for big parts. Um, I have some fun photos of molds that are as tall as I am. Um, this one probably weighs five tons, almost solid steel. Um, most of these mold shops have these, like, cranes that go over, and they pick them up. Um, but each one of these is a different mold. That's what a mold shop looks like. Um, all right, oh, here's the fun video. This is fun. Okay, this is an injection mold. Um, this is molding in process. Um, this is making one of our gears for FTC. So you can see it pops out the gears and it closes again. So every single time, I'm gonna back up, I'll play it again. Every 20 seconds of this, so the mold is being filled with plastic right now. And then you can see boom, it gets dropped out and they fall and then they do it again. And so in that short of amount of time, it's four gears, four gears, four gears. Yeah. What do you mean? So um, the molds actually are self-cleaning to some degree. Um, if you design your parts well where they don't need like a mold release or any chemical to, to get them out of the mold, um, the plastic itself will absorb everything that's there. And so maybe the first 20 shots that you do have issues, um, but those parts are typically thrown away because they're tuning the temperature anyway. And then as you go, the molds keep themselves clean, essentially. Um, if you have a really crappy molder and there's oil and there's stuff all over the place, well, you might have a bad time, but generally it's, it's okay, yeah. So um, it depends on the material. Um, so materials, they, they can go anywhere from about 130 degrees C to maybe up to 300 degrees C, or even higher. Um, it really just depends on the actual material. Rubbers, um, like things that are kind of soft touch, like your phone backs, that's just really low temperature. Things like ABS, polycarbonate, um, Delrins, those are much higher temperature plastics. Yeah. Yes and no, um, that's a great question. So uh, typically the size of the mold uh, determines what type of machine you can use it on, and there's a certain amount of force required to fill a mold. So um, typically molding machines are, are rated by tonnage. So a 10-ton machine, a 20-ton machine, a 30-ton machine. So any 30-ton machine 
can probably do your part. It's more about the size and capacity than anything else. It looks like I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go real quick. Um, case evaluation and modifications. Um, whenever you make the parts, obviously you can touch them up a little bit. Small changes are okay. Big changes are not so good. Um, you can see, like, these are the ejector pin locations, these, like, weird circles. That's where they were pushed out of the mold. Um, you can see we make mistakes. Um, but now that we've kind of seen all of it, we bring it all together. Um, and, you know, you pack them. So what, what I'm going to say is that, like, this is one product that we, that we do. Um, and every single product that we do goes through a very similar process. So I hope this kind of gave you a little bit more of respect of like some of the stuff that goes into the stuff that you use. Um, literally anything physical um, goes through something like this. I mean, it's, there's not much difference between an iPhone and a motor controller in the context of manufacturing. There are different processes, CNCs and lasers, and there's tons of that. But um, you, it's all kind of that same manufacturing is a process that you learn the best way to do it. Uh, some closing thoughts. Uh, designing custom hardware is hard. That's why they call it hardware. Um, but it's really rewarding. Um, I think nothing is cooler than holding something in your hand than you created um, from nothing. I think that's really awesome. Um, one thing can derail the entire process, so plan accordingly. If you picked a component on your board that you just can't get, um, there's nothing you could do about it when you're too far down the, the road, right? If you picked an unobtainium material, one thing can derail it. Um, so even the best plans can go wrong, so leave extra time. It's just, with first, you've got a timeline, so we do too when we build parts. Um, your products can't be everything to everyone, right? We know that our motor controller is not everything to everyone, and teams choose which ones they use. That's what, okay. Uh, any product selection is a thing. Um, failing faster always good, uh, understanding who your customers are, and then really working toward a uh, clearly defined goal is really the success with product manufacturing. Know when to stop. Um, and, and that's all I got. So if you have any more questions, I'm happy to show it. Um, I thought I might have some extra time. I have some bonus videos of random manufacturing processes, but, um, and I'll run those until I get kicked out of this room if people want to stick around. But any questions? Yeah, so um, the question's about inventory levels and stock levels. Um, that's always a challenge. Um, some of the things that we see that other people don't is uh, it's, it really just comes down to the time frame for delivering products is so difficult. We don't know how many of a widget someone is going, a team or someone's going to want during a season. And so it's difficult for us to make them. And especially, and I will say very honestly, making them in Asia for the six week build period makes it very, very difficult to stay in stock. Because if we miss and we're short, it's hard to get more. Um, we also have to manufacture two um, uh, MOQs, or minimum order quantities. So a factory in China, I am not going to be able to order 100 motor controllers from. I need to measure everything I do from the bulk aisle at the supermarket. Like I'm doing scoops of motor controllers as opposed to just grabbing one. And so that, that part is challenging. Um, with FRC specifically, um, uh, Chinese New Year uh, happens right in the middle of build season every single year. So there's like a two week period where you can't get anything made even if you wanted to. Um, so there's a couple things uh, that we see. So uh, the good news is that with as many suppliers that exist now that build a lot of custom hardware, it's a little bit less critical that um, we have everything. Because it's, if we were the only motor controller, that would be different, but because there are lots of options out there, it's not as hard. Um, it may be disappointing if you wanted to use this one specific thing and I'm out of stock. I hear those phone calls every year. But um, there are a lot of alternatives, and I also put it in perspective that says 17 years ago, none of the suppliers existed, and you know what? We figured it out. So there's that. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks, all. <laughs>